Chapter 10 Big Sky Fun Motorized Trips to Town Being away from civilization was a near self-defeating endeavor to describe. We were not living in the Stone Ages, but we had leveraged our situation to be essentially cut off from the rest of the world. We had a radio that performed as a one-way incoming means of staying current. There would be news briefs, there would be weather reports, there would be sports recaps. We took advantage of Casey Kasem's Top 40. All remaining elements of humanity would be furnished by the little ski town of Whitefish. Trips to Whitefish truly were events and the infrequency was by design. To feel the effects of isolation and so they would be special and efficient. Many times we would wait several weeks before going back into town. Additionally, the winter discouraged frequent travel. We had to park the Aloha at the neighbors due to the few miles of access roads that led to our cabin being unplowed and inaccessible. This imposed a pleasurable stroll to their cabin through heavy snow, frequently carrying out dirty laundry, garbage, and recyclables. Next, we put on snow chains to drive down a fearfully steep driveway with an unnerving drop on one side. The return would mean hauling clean clothes, supplies, and food provisions. Whether a third of a mile or a quick tour from a driveway, a single core credence would never alter. The principle that taking more than one trip to bring in groceries is an unmitigated sin, no matter how many bags lay in wait. A core belief that we all have an inner Sherpa related to grocery transport. There would be a new batch of letters or packages to send or receive. There would be phone calls made to hear our loved ones' voices. The payphone became a way to catch up with a real-time instrument on details that slipped through the cracks of thorough letter communication. Mom and Dad were always around and thrilled to take in fresh stories. Oftentimes, the phone call set their worries to bed. There were photos to be developed. Back in the glory days of film... These moments were filled with great apprehension and uncertainty to find out how the pictures actually turned out. Snaps of boundless love promised a picture should be good, but until that delicate scroll and its plastic cocoon are offered to the gods of the darkroom and their teenage servants, you never knew if the speed and exposure were set properly. That hour or so of waiting bred intimidation or restlessness and served to remind you of how insignificant and powerless you are as an amateur film photographer. Some grasp of togetherness mended while in town. The odd stares that the locals gave us disheveled kids would become comforting. Their antipathy for our mere existence flapped in the breeze like a mobile welcome banner. Maybe the term antipathy exaggerated reality slightly, but we were definitely blatant outsiders, having no shaves, haircuts, or smell awareness, perhaps served no favors for our adoptability either. Being that we did not have trash pickup at the cabin, our discards oftentimes required us to carry it for large distances, and there could be some residual runoff that further fostered our scent. That modified waste management took place at the covert partnership with the local grocery store and their dumpster. By partnership, I mean, they never would catch us dumping rubbish in their bins. Certainly not the most legal thing done in life of men in their early twenties, but our patronage as loyal customers softened the malpractice. For example, nearly everything thrown away had been procured from that store. We were quite likely the most environmentally conscious rule-benders around, given we carried out assorted metals, plastics, and glass a third of a mile to be lawfully recycled. Hopefully you're not a senior Whitefish grocery store executive reading this with clear 20-year-old footage, a willing legal team, and a 60-minute crew on standby. In the unfortunate event that happens, I gave full disclosure that some events of this memoir were vastly exaggerated. So by no means is this a confession. I have a rock-solid alibi written in Big Sky to Big City that puts me in the cabin, writing a letter with words that rhyme with Wayne. What an awkward courtroom scenario indeed. Doing laundry was less covert. Though, there should have been a crime how badly a shirt can smell with weeks of wear. A small laundromat catered to the uneasy intertwining of locals. On occasion, with some funding from family for the holidays and birthdays, 
We would dine on pizza at the bowling alley. A legion of lanes and a bar area clearly validated the venue as one of the most influential social gathering sites in the county. Bowling leagues ran daily. Groups of friends laughed and cursed around available pool tables and dartboards. We were not part of the gatherings at any point, but we unknowingly prepared for a grand event from which the likes the venue would ever see. What did patrons of a bowling alley really wish from their experience? What did an entire county of taxpayers want from their bowling alley? That moment of reckoning would be upon us, but not yet. About 15 miles south was a larger town, Kalispell. This emerged as the go-to spot whenever Whitefish could not meet our needs, mainly a movie theater and a Walmart. A comforting town for its size and neighbored a much larger lake, Flathead Lake. The sequence of seclusion, excellent movie selection, and not having a television made for some of the most enjoyable motion picture experiences. Over the course of Montana's continuation, we had watched Green Mile, Man on the Moon, and Toy Story 2. Watching those were events in themselves and built up a sense of wonderment, known only by those similar settings as a child. The venue boasted not as the biggest or highest quality, but, as a whole, the aura immersed me. Revisiting those exact movies later in life still kindles delightful affections of the Kalispell Theater experience. Man on the Moon and Green Mile persist in my sacred top five favorite film list, despite 20 years of contemporary movies bidding to loot those spots away. What a suitable movie Man on the Moon evidenced while residing in a cabin in the woods with all the utter indifference towards fitting in. One quote in particular suggested all the cabin fever antics Andy and I were bewitched by appropriately. The letters we wrote to perplexed recipients being a masterful example. Kaufman's agent chastises Kaufman for his comedy styles and bits that kept getting everyone in trouble. So, what do you have here? A big, elaborate joke that's only funny to two people in the universe. Only funny to two people in the universe. The phrase fits so thoroughly in that creative laboratory of a cabin. We summoned such unrelenting brilliance in our letters, it appeared, and laughed to the point of stomach pains routinely. But realistic expectations faded the minute we licked the adhesive on envelopes destined for our friends and family. A big, elaborate joke that's only funny to two people in the universe. Sometimes, only two folks laughing is enough. I recall my friend Jim told me about a documentary on Andy Kaufman and all of his bizarre antics. Such a different kind of guy. R.E.M.'s new song, The Great Beyond, was part of the film's soundtrack and would later become my penciled-in soundtrack to all the cabin fever that fermented. Thanksgiving Day Starting Lineup Due to the seclusion, holidays had a way of siphoning out the madness. Thanksgiving would be one of the first. We needed to bring in help for this. Vice, who was on break from Montana State several hours away, picked up a ride over to Whitefish. Andy's recollection of the coming days best documents the chaos. We went to the pin and queue to wait for Vice. I didn't feel like bowling. He's the same jerk. I say jerk in the friendliest way possible. We got back to the cabin and headed out for a small night hike up to Kim's Point. The path was visible due to the full moon reflecting light on the clouds and the snow on the trees. Looking out at the hazy valley, Vice told us stories in the silence that was occasionally broken by the distant rumbling of a train. He claims to have a bunch of girls after him, but I believe him. Why not believe him? We headed over to the ski hill with the intent to run down it peacefully. I'll just say that Vice has only been here for a few hours, and I already have a huge gash on my left hand and Brad has a bad limp. It must have been a dandy of a sight to see as the three of us came to a tumbling halt at the foot of the hill. He wants to do it again tomorrow. I admit that it was a memorable experience, but I'll stick to running down it by myself. Calms, 11, 23, 99. We were all tumbling down that steep and snowy ski hill, but Andy and I received the worst of it. Laughing muscles were exercised. The run-versus-walk controversy proved yet again to be in my favor. 
It only cost me a busted-up knee to prove my point. The day started with blood running from my nose due to a skirmish with Vice, but soon he had blood running from his mouth, so we're even. Brad and Vice discussed the idea of putting on a three-man play for no audience. I suggested to each write down a bunch of topics, then put them in a hat and each draw one. I drew one of Brad's. Can invisible people masturbate? We plan to read them tomorrow night, but we won't be reading our own. We bundled up and headed to the train tracks with the intent to get beyond the bolted iron gate of the abandoned tunnel. We spent a long time unscrewing six bolts, but the gate still didn't come free from the cement. In a final effort, I tried to wedge myself in through the top, but it was too narrow. When we were about to leave in disgust, Vice asked me if I think I can fit through a gap near the bottom. I slid through easily. Vice and Brad followed not so easily. We then embarked on a memorable adventure into the pitch darkness of the tunnel without a flashlight. We made it safely to the other side, then attempted to play tricks on each other on the way back. Nobody succeeded in scaring the others. Calms, 11, 24, 99. What a sick idea for a fake speech. What kind of sh shameful person would write that down? When that first Thanksgiving feast took place back in 1621, neither Governor Bradford nor the great Wampanoag Chief Massasoit predicted their celebration would morph throughout time. A new country became born a century later, and inevitably, the celebration would earn recognition as a national holiday. So much so that a giant parade, littered with flying cartoons, became synergistic with the day. The bad boys of Plymouth wished that it had ended there. Happy Thanksgiving! Vice talks in his sleep. I'm back in my room tonight while he's sleeping upstairs. Brad and Vice prepared the feast today while I laid upstairs and continued reading Ender's Game. They moved the table in front of the wood burner, then came upstairs and we silently prayed. Then Brad introduced us like a sports announcer as we approached the table. It was hilarious. When I went to introduce him, I couldn't think of anything to say, so I just said, And now, Brad. I should have went on about how he cooked the food and about his Indian heritage, but I froze. Oh well, the food was great. After we ate, we talked about our favorite Lisk memories, and then I went back upstairs to read while they cleaned up. Should I feel bad? I don't. I took a nap, but was awakened by Vice's knee in my kidney. We went for a night hike in the snow slash drizzle. We walked in the pitch blackness until our eyes could see the white road. Brad read my speech over the balcony first thing today. Vice made sure to say, oh geez, a few times, but overall it got a good response. Neither of them wrote one. When we got back from the night hike, Brad resumed his position on the balcony and read from a horror stories book, but it was stupid, so he stayed by the stove for a long time and reminisced. I look forward to one day reminiscing about falling down the ski hill or breaking into the tunnel or whatever happens tomorrow. Calms, 11, 25, 99. It is plausible to suggest that no other Thanksgiving, going back to its ceremonial origins, contained a segment that so adequately paid homage to the extensivity of the lavish meal. A feast overflowing with turkey, stuffing, cornbread, rolls, cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes and gravy, garlic corn and pumpkin pie warrants a matching introduction to the table. For each of the dinner participants to be announced to their seats by having their names called out as if pilgrimage starters in the NBA Finals, a motif that awaits widespread adoption across the states. I woke up at 2 p.m. to Vice not giving me crap, but actually bringing me breakfast in bed. Three delicious pancakes. We all sat around the table in front of the stove and played Clue, then bundled up and headed down to Murray Lake. When we got there, the stars had become visible, so we laid in the snow and gazed. There was a strange flash that lit up the whole sky, and it didn't look like lightning. That was weird. After an uncontrolled laughter spell, we walked back through the snow. Once again, we sat by the stove and reminisced. I finished this peaceful day by finishing my letter to Matt. He's a quarter of a century old today. Vice leaves in the morning. Calms, 11 27, 99. That would conclude the only guest during that entire time at the cabin. And if that mysterious flash was a UFO, then the entity must have been frightened by the maniacal laughter we exhibited. There can be no alien in any galaxy that would probe three insane men such as us. They go for the low-hanging fruit. Sane people are far safer subjects. December Internal Combustion 
The wood-burning stove superintended the entertainment for many nights. The warmth enforced strict decrees of proximal comfort. Failure to obey meant cool extremities and a fruitless finale to perfect days. If a night were closed without watching the faded glow of embers, then another diversion stole our eyes and ears. Occasional movie nights, where we would just sit and listen to favorite films. Yes, we listened to the audio portion of movies. City slickers would bring the essential yearning for popcorn. We've got a lot of time on our hands. What does that mean, on our hands? Are they the hands of a clock, or my hands? Either way, it's not very clear. If it wasn't for the lot of time part, it would be completely ridiculous. Brad popped popcorn on the wood burner as we watched slash listened to city slickers. He set the popcorn pot on the carpet and it burned a round spot. We'll turn it around tomorrow. Calms 10 99 For Halloween, festivities called for gathering around and carving pumpkins. Listening to the audio recording of The Burbs soon followed. Those same movies that we heard while driving out to Montana would be the same we would sit on the couch and bring to life while staring at a flickering orange glass window. In some ways, we were eclipsing the original viewing experience by tuning in to the subtle nuances, depriving our pictorial senses. For a visual slapstick movie such as Naked Gun with Leslie Nielsen, scenes were oftentimes undervalued based on their de-emphasis of ridiculous scenarios. One scene best illustrates this where the hostile henchman yells from an elevated position on behalf of his boss, I got a message for you from Vincent Ludwig. This was succeeded by inaudible shouting, masked by the henchman's gunfire directed towards Leslie Nielsen. All the while, Leslie Nielsen obviously responds, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Don't fire the gun while you're talking. Though starting the stove proved fairly simple, such repetitiveness summons the contempt for mandatory daily chores. A chore that obliged one out of two people to reluctantly fulfill the demand each evening. Light-hearted bets would be the means for an amicable settlement. A wager's stakes, payout, and odds earned election based on the ever-changing themes of the occasion. Ridiculous topics were nominated. Whether someone would talk about girls at any point during the day, professional sports and board game outcomes, guessing the temperature of the wood-burning stove once lit, who had brought in the least amount of mail at the post office, that being a notably bitter and compounding consequence, debts were commonly paid on time, and the concept tended to work. One such sporting event worthy of wager was Super Bowl Thirty-Four, the Tennessee Titans versus the St. Louis Rams. A somewhat hometown team, having just come from Nashville, though we were not around while they first played in the city during the 1999 season under the name of Titans. They finished the previous year by the legacy name of Oilers at Vanderbilt Stadium. Tennessee steamrolled forward on a glorious Super Bowl run as beneficiaries to the legendary Music City Miracle, consisting of a last-second touchdown in the wild-card matchup. In the cabin, the simplistic approach allowed only for listening to the festivity. Sure, we could have gone to the bowling alley or some other bar to watch, but ardently chose to pilot a new medium. And by new, I mean old. How spectatorship occurred perhaps before there even were Super Bowls, by radio. The listening experience would not be fireside due to the unfortunate reception to the station hosting the broadcast while downstairs. Instead, we would be huddled on the loft. Fireside or not, the brilliant commentating helped paint the field, players, and plays. The game hosted all the suspense a football fan required. A championship that came down to a failed goal line play to tie the score. St. Louis and their grocery-bagging quarterback stymied the hopeful sequel to the Music City Miracle. Years later, I would watch a replay of the game and be disappointed. The radio waves seemed to tell a much better tale. To this day, Super Bowl Thirty-Four is the only Super Bowl that I have not seen part of live since the early 90s, which included stretches overseas.
When movies or radio event opportunities ran out, board games quickly filled the vacancy. A certain Christmas present stepped up the tensions. A new sequence board brought a commencement to edgy battles. Andy had a complete advantage in the beginning, as he had played the game before. He understood the strategies. Though after time, the fortunes of glory would sway. They would sway like Andy's moods upon accepting defeat. And the wood-burning stove would not be the only fire stoked during those splendiferous victories. Then, Brad beat me at sequence and rubbed it in so hard that I nearly lost my head. I hate losing! Calms 2-16-2000 Sometimes winning sweetens immeasurably. When staring at a discolored face to the shade of silent rage red, by confecting a well-formed, brittle smile birthed in conquest. A smile that can only result in the opponent taking their hand and clearing the table. That is exactly what happened. A micro-tornado, specific only to board game pieces, ripped through the cabin on that controversial February evening, leaving no sequence pieces in its wake. The board and cards scattered all throughout the hardwood floor, removing any evidence of victory and defeat. I do not recall a Yeti-like roar stitched to the ferocious hand swiping, but such a sound was fervently implied as steam whistled out from his ears. The only resulting trace of victory remained from the honorable verbal agreement that Andy would light the stove for the next few days as part of a lost wager. I stared at the mess nervously aware of my testament to the advanced stages of terminal cabin fever.